Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, let me go back a little bit. When you were, um, when you had left Deborah Romero's house and then headed to your mom's house on October 21st, 2007, um, when you, you mentioned that you had uh, attempted to uh, get in touch with Tara, get her to respond to you because everything had completely stopped. Is that right? Yes. What um, what time, during what time period were you uh, trying to get a hold of Heather? Do you know? Tara. Excuse me, Tara. Um, uh, did you know, did you know, um, um, you talked about this text that you sent her inviting her to go eat at Michante. Um, do you know when you did that? What no. was going on when you did that? I think I was driving. Okay, I were you driving. from where to where? Um, between Albuquerque and Las Lunas, I believe. Okay, all right. So it would have been sometime around mm -hmm. eight or a little somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. Okay. Late evening. Now, when you um, when you would come back to Heather after these breakups. Excuse me, Tara. Now I did it both ways twice. I am so very, very sorry. Uh, when you would come back to Tara after these um, frequent breakups, um, what, what was motivating you to come back? Most of the time, I uh, honestly, I, I would feel sorry for her most of the time. Like, um, she just painted a very sad picture of her, of where she was um, emotionally, and I, I felt bad for her most of the time. And then some of the time, I, I missed her, you know. Sometimes what? I missed her. Okay. We talked about you uh, um, uh, 
uh, turning off your phone that Saturday night that you spent with uh, Deborah Romero. Um, did you f turn off your phone the previous Friday night? No, I didn't. No. Uh, so were you, did you notice these hundred and some calls you were getting? I did, and that's, uh, it, it made for an awkward situation. I remember even stashing my phone, like in my bag somewhere, so Deborah wouldn't hear it, because she was just calling constantly. I don't know how many times, uh, over a hundred. Yeah. It was just constantly, you know, I don't want a repeat of that on Saturday night. So I just turned it off. Okay. Um, during that month of October, okay. This, um, <coughs> I'm going to see if I can find one of those pictures and I should have done it earlier. Oh, the list. Very nice. So what did you keep in that cabinet that there? there? Um, I kept some like loose equipment. Um, maybe some old uniforms that don't fit no more. Yes, I did. Why did you leave that gun there? There for Tara. Well, protect her if somebody came back. So I wanted to give her some kind of protection. Okay. There was testimony in the <coughs> this trial that uh <coughs> after after showing her how to shoot that sometime later in the later on down the road you told her that if anybody came to burglarize to just start blasting uh mm -hmm. did you tell her that? I did. Okay. Why would you give her such vague instructions? Because it's not like she had shot a gun like a year before and we were just mess clinking shooting cans it wasn't like oh, I'm teaching her how to be some SWAT member it was just we we're just messing around but when I started getting worried I knew she wasn't really competent with the gun I mean she knew how to pull a trigger that's it she didn't know how to do like reloads and all this stuff SWAT member it was just we we're just messing around but when I started getting worried, I knew she wasn't really competent with the gun. I mean, she knew how to pull a trigger, that's it. She didn't know how to do like reloads and all this stuff. And just start blasting. Like it's just that, it's literally that simple. Just pull the trigger until there's no more bullets. And I, I didn't want to make it complicated and do this big old thing with her because I knew it wouldn't be retained. I mean, well, what, if she, what if she... She missed her target. 
I don't care. I mean, I just wanted that person gone. If he got scared and took off, left that. Let me just ask it to you this way, Levi. After you were charged a couple of years ago, um, and when we eventually started getting some of the discovery in this case, no. Did you see the note that Tara wrote that was uh, torn up in the trash? No. Did you see? her diary no I didn't I didn't even know she had a diary okay. ever when did you first learn and she had a diary um, uh, was there also a, an, uh, an electric uh, 
alarm clock on that table? There was. And was there also an iPod? In charger being charged? Yes. And, and was there also a clamp, lamp, a lamp that has a clamp to clamp it on the, the, the bedroom where Tara's telephone was being charged um, do you know whether that's the place where she the, the phone was ordinarily kept I don't recall okay would there have been any room I'm going to uh, show you a couple of photographs now. This has been admitted as state First of all, did you have more than one APD uniform? Yes, I had, a, I had a lot of uniforms. Okay. Uh, did APD come out with uh, short sleeve summer uniforms and long sleeve win winter uniforms? Yes, they did. <coughs> are you able to tell from these photographs what these are? I can't tell um, if that's a short sleeve or long sleeve. Okay. But I, I had a lot of uh, uniform shirts also that didn't fit me anymore. I was uh, I started lifting weights about five months before this happened, and I gained a lot of weight. Okay. Um, um and uh, this uh, area here, is that where the Glock was kept? Yes. Okay. And are these drawers beneath it? Yes. So this would be the top drawer if somebody considered these drawers. Objection, Your Honor. Are you able to tell any better from uh, States Exhibit 29? The shirts are that, or not? Not really. It looks like the short sleeve, but I don't. I don't know for sure. Okay. I'd like to talk a little bit about your um, insurance, um, and I'm talking specifically about life insurance, okay? okay. Um, had, had you purchased any life insurance through the Albuquerque Police Department? No. Was it available? I'm sure it was. Okay. Did you purchase any life insurance through the uh, Aviation Police? No. Did you purchase any uh, insurance through the Rio Rancho Police? No. Okay. Did uh, and and if you had, that would be c that come out of your pay, probably. Right. I, I had health insurance, but not life insurance. Okay. Did the health insurance come out of your pay? Health insurance, yes. Okay. And that was for your whole family. Yes. Okay. And um, when did you, oh, let me ask you this: Did you have any? Um, uh, private policies that you just went out and bought from an from an insurance company for your family as far as life insurance goes? No. Okay. <coughs> you remember an interview with Aaron Jones when he asked you if you had any insurance? Yes, I do. And you answered him no, right? That's correct. But you followed that up with that your military was working on it? Yes. 
Well, what did you mean by uh, when you? Why did you mention military in the same breath? Did you? Because um, I wasn't sure at the time. Uh, I was in the Army National Guard, and it had come through discussion um, that I probably I might have some through the Army National Guard that I didn't know about. And sure enough, when you um, did you want me to go into details? Yeah. W whenever you enlist in the Army, um, you have to. It's like mandatory, and uh, normally they charge like three dollars a month for their, for a hundred thousand dollars life insurance. But in uh, New Mexico, the governor passed some bill where it's actually free for us. So I had it, and I didn't know about it. And it's actually the same life insurance I had going back all the way to 1999, which is like 14 years ago when I first joined the Coast Guard. It's the same life insurance I always had. And uh, I thought when I got out of active duty, I didn't have it anymore. But it turned out in the National Guard, they still like honor it. And I, I didn't have the details for Jones at the time. I, uh, that's why I said I, I think my military is working on it. But I was under the assumption also that since she committed suicide, it wouldn't even be covered anyway. So I really wasn't counting on it. All right. Um, do you remember when you changed from one branch of the military to another branch of the military that you had to sign all the same mandatory paperwork? Yes, I had. To. It was. It's the same um, paperwork any soldier or any airman, any sailor would have to fill out. It's just standard across the board. And so the policy was the same, even though you changed over and got a new policy in October, same coverage. It just rolled over, yes, sir, as long as you were a military member. And it, it, was, it was free in the state of New Mexico? In the state of New Mexico, it was free. I don't know about other states. Okay. And you, you did have, a, a, and the, the 100000 was the standard amount that came with it? Um, there was options, and I think there, it's in Discovery somewhere. You guys can see it. Um, like, you can check a box for more or, or less, and I didn't check any box. So automatically they gave me a hundred. Okay. Um, All right. Um, so you could opt out of the life insurance on yourself or opt out of the life insurance on Terra. You could, but I mean, my unit I was in, it was a, a combat military police unit, and, and they were talking about deployments and stuff. That's why I wanted to join that unit, because I thought, they would go over to Iraq. Um, I would. I wouldn't have opted out. That would have been very irresponsible. Okay. I want to talk to you a little bit about. Um, about right after Tara died and uh, your relations with the Cordova family. Um, did you go over to their house? Um, just that next day after Tara died, that was it. All right. And I think you said they treated you decently? They did. And it was a, you had civil conversation? We did. Were you ever you know, friendly, if you know, warm friends, warm with the Cordova family? Before Terra died? Yeah. Um, I was always respectful, and they were always uh, civil to me. They were never, they never mistreated me. Um, but we didn't have, like, a close, a close relationship or, you know. Okay. But it was civil, I guess is the word. Okay. Um, after Tara died, did you um, uh, speak to the family about uh, giving them back a couple of pieces of furniture? I did. And which pieces of furniture were those? Um, the cabinet, like you guys just saw the picture of the cabinet. I didn't want, I was starting to kind of transition to go back to the house and I didn't want uh, to ever look at that cabinet again. Um, also did, did, had Tara, had Tara, um, painted that? Yeah, she, she stained it. She painted it green and stained it, and uh, she was real proud of it. And there was a cab, uh, like a dresser also th that the TV was on. Um, it was stained the same color, and I just, if I was going to get rid of the cabinet, because it held the gun, you know, I might as well get rid of the, the dresser too. And I didn't want to just get rid of it, 
I asked, I called the Cordovas and see if they wanted it. Okay. And did I you? I spoke to Joseph. Okay. Did you remind Joseph that Tara had painted those? I did. Okay. And did they take you up on your offer? No. They said they didn't want it. Okay. Um, so when they turned down the, uh, the cabinet and the dresser, what happened to the cabinet and the dresser in the immediate? Uh, Immediately, I think it trans moved it to like the garage. They felt like that cabinet was just like, I'm not really superstitious, but like a curse or something. I didn't like it. I didn't want it. I was like, well, if they don't want it, why sh I'm going to go throw it in the dump. I mean, my dad went through in the dump. Okay, and how long after Tara died did that happen? Mm, three weeks to a month, maybe. Okay. Now, <coughs> you heard the testimony from Joseph Cordova that uh, you said something to him to the effect of, I have no more tears for your daughter. You recall that testimony? I do, but that, that's not accurate. Okay. Tell the members of the jury what it is you said, if you can recall. I, I remember being in dialogue with them. We were talking, and they were in shock, and I was in shock. And I said something to the effect of, like, I, I, I can't be quoted, but something to the effect of, like, I know I don't even have any more tears left or something like that. And what did you mean by that? Meaning... We all had been crying for the 24 hours or 10, 12 hours at that point or whatever, meaning them too. You know I mean, I, it was like, it was dialogue. It wasn't like I just said, I have no tears for your daughter. I, he would have probably attacked me if I would have said that. I, I would never do that. It's really just dis disrespectful. Okay. So y you were conveying that all of you had been crying for a long time. Yeah, it was, it was dialogue. It was conversation. And, and I, I said, like, I know, like... I don't even have any more tears left or something like that. But I didn't mean it like rude. Okay. Um, there was also testimony that you told Joseph Cordova the after Tara died that this will be all over in a week. Uh, what can you tell the jury about that? I did say that. But I didn't say it like that. Again, they make it sound so rude. I really told them. I think like as far as like Jones looking into me, I literally told Joseph, I was like, this is gonna be over in a week. They're gonna see that I had nothing to do. This isn't suspicious. I, Cause at that point, I thought Aaron Jones, I thought he was legit. I thought he was a good, a normal cop. I didn't know he was insane. So I thought it would be over in a week. I really did. And, and I thought that for a long time. I thought, well maybe next week will be over. And I was like that for like four months. Five months, I really thought, it'll, this will be all worked out eventually. I didn't know, I never thought I'd be here talking to a jury. Had you given him uh, permission to search the house? Yeah, I didn't care. I gave him oh, everything. You gave him the phone? Everything. I even wrote down the hand, I said, anything you need. He wanted a consent to search or a consent to look at the computer and the telephone and you wrote out a handwritten consent? Yes, I, anything. I, I opened my life to him. Anything you want to know, I was open to. After uh, you had that interview with Aaron Jones at your house, uh, did you meet with him on a couple more occasions? I did. And uh, did you ever uh, uh, bring in an attorney with you or anything like that? No. I, as far as I was concerned, I had nothing to hide. And the faster he found it, the faster me and the kids and every, my family could just move on. I mean, I was an open book. Okay. And I thought an attorney would slow that down because, you know, attorneys don't want you to say nothing. But I wanted to say stuff. I wanted him to know everything. Okay. Did the, your relationship with the Cordova family change or did they continue to be um, um, civil with you? It changed. Okay. Um, at some point you wrote a, a, a four page handwritten letter to Joseph and Teresa and Aaron and Josh. I did. 
And uh, what were you trying to accomplish, if anything, with that letter? I remember when I was writing it, I was uh, just say I was very low, like spiritually, I was deep, depressed isn't the word. I was just, I've never been so rock bottom in my life. I just wanted to die and I, I would ask God to just, just take me. I was just so low. I thought before I died, I wanted them to know how she felt about them. And I really didn't blame them at the time because I thought, well, because I was on the news and stuff all the time. They were just saying all these lies about me. And uh, I didn't want the court of us to think it was true. I, I still cared about what they thought. And um, I thought, if I'm going to die, I want everybody to know the truth and how she felt about them. Not just, I want them to know good stuff about her. I don't want them to remember all this. And uh, so I sat down, I wrote them a letter, and uh, I don't remember what it said. You guys have it, but uh, I wrote like something to Joseph uh, about Tara, things he, she would tell me about him. Uh, Your Honor, I think that uh, throughout this uh, through, throughout this examination, what we're talking about is his is uh, is his feelings. And right now, all he was talking about, without going into specifics of what he said to who, he was pointing out that there would be one section of the letter written to one family member and then another section of the letter written to another family member and that's all I'm trying to get out. And, and that's fine, Your Honor. He was about to go what he wrote to that family member. Right. You can explore, Mr. Schneider, but don't get into what you said. Yeah. So don't get into what you said. Um, yeah, I don't even remember what I said. I just... I wrote something to Joseph saying... Um, don't say what you said. Things to the effect of happy memories, Tara shared with me to Joseph. Okay. And um and the same thing to Teresa and Aaron and Joshua. And there were she had relationships with there there were different relationships with each of them. So it was um it was kind of custom to them and I just wanted them to know. And then later it came out that I gave the letter to Joseph and Teresa and they they didn't even share it with Josh or Aaron. They took it straight to Aaron Jones and they got I found it in a case file later. I didn't even they didn't care. So. Did you um, uh, so when you were writing a portion to Josh, you were talking about, and I'm not getting into hearsay. You were talking about things that um, Tara felt um, specifically for Josh. Yes. And same with Teresa. Yes, it was. It was like, yes. Okay. It wasn't just a general letter. It's to all of them. Okay, so you were conveying to each family member uh, stuff um, about Tara that related specifically to that family member? Yes. Okay. Do you remember talking to Regina Cordova uh, and uh, her asking you uh, what had happened to Tara? Um, yes, I do. She came, it was maybe, I don't remember the date, it was a few days after um, Tara died and I was at my mom's house still and she just showed up uh, and which is fine. I, I really, I've always loved Gina like a sister and she showed up and she just she asked me to go to the back room to talk to her about what happened, and I told her. She testified to it, and um, I just told her what happened, and that was it. Okay. Now, um,
after Terah died, how long was it before you went back to the house at Eleven Ash Place? Probably a few days after the funeral, I imagine. Okay. Um, did you know anything about family members of yours boxing stuff up? No, I didn't have anything to do with the... Uh, all I remember is the bed was gone because, um, as you guys heard, my supervisor cut the mattress and left the box being stuff. Well, my dad and my uncle, I think it was my uncle, I don't even know, um, they took the whole... I don't know who. Just hold on. Let the judge rule. Yeah. So my father and um, other. He knows. He knows it was his father. Just say you don't my know who the other person was, and maybe they'll sit down. My father. Okay. Um. They took the the torn mattress and box spring to the dump, and uh, they they threw that. So that was obviously gone. And um, that was about all I noticed as far as um, things being rearranged. There was nothing. The cabinet and the dresser was still there. The TV was still there. It was okay. Um, did there come a time when you were contacted by Katrina Garley? Yes. Now, you, you saw her testify here, right? I did. And she was the lady from the Verizon store, right? Yes. And you had a... a brief sexual relationship with her? Yes. Okay. So after Tara died, um, y you were in touch with one another? No. Um, it was probably like two and a half weeks maybe. Okay. Three weeks after Tara died. And, uh, it's like, like I said earlier, like the thing with Tara, when she's gone, it was like, I, w I was t when she was here, I always took her for granted. I did. But she was always there. I could call her and we would talk and on the phone and stuff. And she was, I mean, she was gone. I, I really felt like I remember when I talked to Aaron Jones um, that night. And he asked me who I wanted to call. And he asked me, like, well, do you have any friends you want to call? And I said, I couldn't think of one person that I could really call, like, that I considered a a friend and because I would call Tara if something happened to me and um, so going back to Katrina you know I, it was like two weeks three weeks I don't know the date that she came over but uh, okay. I hadn't talked to nobody I really isolated myself and um, I didn't talk to anybody I kind of cocooned myself even, even Deborah called a few times after Tara died, and I really liked Deborah before the bite. It was just I didn't want to go back to like pre death. You know what I mean? And are you talking about like women? your habit of sleeping with yeah. lots of women? But when Katrina called, she called late one. She texted me, or and I finally texted her back and called me, and she. Um, I don't know if she asked me to come over or, or what, but I think she brought some food or something like that. And um, we were intimate. And I, I don't have any excuse. I just, I was very lonely. And I could see myself like reverting back to my old habits very easily. And even when Katrina was there, I knew it was like, I can't, uh, like, this has got to stop, you know? Like, that was, that was then, and this is now. And so Katrina was, like, the last, uh, we were intimate in that. Did, were you ever intimate again with, with Katrina, no. darling? No. So I was just, I was just very lonely. Um... When did you have your first face-to-face -face, um, 
meeting with your wife, Heather Chavez? Face to face, uh, it was very early October. Whenever um, I went to that to CCU, like I explained earlier, um, the sergeant told me just to show up. And again, CCU is what? Uh, Crimes Against Children Unit. Okay. And Heather was a detective there. I, di I didn't. Before that, I never met Heather. Apparently, I talked to her on the phone um, in May for that report I had to do. But I didn't know I was who I was talking to really. Um, okay. But the first time I've actually seen her ever in my life was uh, early October. Okay. So in May, it was police business, and you were doing a children's court case, and she was the detective? Yeah. When, you, when an officer responds to um, different calls, it could be narcotics, it could be child abuse, um, it could be anything. There's specialized units to handle that kind of um, case. And so the reporting officer, who would be me, I would just take initial, an initial report, just the facts, and I would fo have to call the on-call detective to whoever unit I was dealing with. In this case, it was a child abuse uh, unit. So I called the on-call detective, which happened to be Heather. And um, that was um, the first time I ever talked to her. Okay. But then you didn't see her and actually meet her until October. Correct. Okay. And uh, did you have a second shadow with her on October 16th? October 16th. Um, well my first one was October, early October. I don't know if it was the 16th, though. Okay. That was the first one. I don't remember when it was, but it was the first well, one. If it had, was it about a week before, maybe October 8th? Yeah, around there. All that's right. That's probably a better date. Um, yeah, the sergeant of CCU, Crimes Against Children, he told me just to show up and I could shadow one of his detectives. And uh, he said somebody will be there. What's the sergeant's name? Um, sergeant Swanson. Okay. And I talked to him on the cell phone. I didn't. I never met him. I didn't meet him until later on. Okay. Um, and when I reported to CCU in the morning, I met a detective, um, Jerry Sanders. And she, um, she was like the acting supervisor for, for some reason, I think, because she was a veteran there and she was calling all the shots. She's like, well, you can go with Heather because she's here. And... Um, she walked me to Heather's office, and that's the first time I met Heather. Okay. And so the second time you uh, met Heather was when after that? Um, well, we worked together that day. I don't know how many hours, but maybe a week later I went back to CCU, okay. and I rode with her again, um, shadowing. Okay. And uh, did you learn that uh, the second time that you saw Heather that uh, she had been on a whole lot of episodes of that TV show, Cops? Yeah. Um, um, I was surprised. I was like, you know, she's on Cops, and she's told me to check it out and um, Google it and stuff like that, go on YouTube and check it out. All right. And uh, did you go back to um, uh, Albuquerque, excuse me, back down to Las Lunas that day after you were done with your shadowing? I believe so, yes. Okay. And did you uh, uh, do an internet search for Heather Hindi? Eventually I did, yeah, to find the video. Which video? Of Cops. Okay. So you learned she'd been on episodes of Cops and you wanted to look at those? Yeah, she told me about it. Okay. So when did a relationship with uh, Heather start developing? Mm, well, let's see, November. She would check, on, call and check on me. Like um, we kept in contact, and she called check on me every now and then. She would call me once every two days, I think. I don't know, and we would talk and. But it was just that, and towards the end of November, probably, okay. we really started talking a lot more. Um, maybe mid November, maybe, I don't know. How is it that, I mean, if, if you can put words to it, what was it that made this relationship with Heather start blooming? Oh, Heather was amazing. Like, at first, when I first met her, she was real, like, business-like, you know, um, She's real businesslike, and uh, 
but we started getting to know each other and she was just smart and funny and we had so much in common and we talked about philosophy we talked about everything like she was really interesting to talk to you and we have um i learned her her father committed suicide i learned that she told me and um so we she kind of talked to me about some things i was grappling with and some i was really angry about it um and obviously i had to blame myself a lot and she helped she kind of talked to me about those kind of things because she's experienced similar things and we I just loved her like she's just amazing and uh, that was I'd say really the end of November we really started like I didn't want it she was it she was it yeah I just, I just loved her like okay I never wanted to be without her Did you ever go through any kind of uh, grief counseling uh, or anything like that for your after Tara died? Not grief counseling, but uh, I really was not happy with the man I was before Tara died. I was not happy. I didn't want to live my life that way anymore. And uh, I, I saw, like, I'm Catholic. Um, that's how I grew up. So I didn't know have any other. Uh, I need to know what happened. Like, I, I went straight to God. And I was like, I need to know all these things, how to change, and what happened. Like, is this my fault? All the I blame myself for everything. I thought, I thought like I was damned, but like God, like going through all this stuff, like is punishment and uh, so I talked to priests I talked to a lot of priests about what happened uh, don't say what they said but it's been a process you know um, but yeah I, I consider that counseling the spiritual counseling I don't really consider it like a I don't know psychology okay did you um, do you still feel that guilt over the kind of husband you were to Tara? I I do, of course I do. But I didn't know about, when I felt all this shame and guilt, I didn't know about Nick Wheeler and the problems she was having with him. I, did, I had no idea. So all of it was on me. And as things, I still feel guilt, but I don't, I, I understand that I'm not, she made a decision and there was other factors in her life that I didn't even know about. Okay. Now there has been um some uh, testimony about you opening up a personal checking account while Tara was still alive with just your name on it? I did. Okay. Uh, what, who was the account holder for the checking account you had before that? Um, it was me, Tara, and she had her mother, my mother-in-law at the time, Teresa, on the account also. Okay. So, and that was a household checking account or what? That's where my uh, direct deposits came in, the account for that. Okay, and so it was you, Tara, and Tara's mom were yes. on that. Okay, and um, so there came a time when you opened up a checking account with just your name? Yeah, um, during one of our separations, I think it was uh, January, February, I really, um, I, wanted, I wanted more control. Like I wanted to like actually try making child support payments as opposed to because when, usually when we separated, she still had free reign with my debit card, and I really didn't care. I wasn't ever a big spender that much, so like she would just buy all this stuff. And um, but it, it's really hard to live your life like that. Like I never knew a balance or anything like that. And I was wanting, if we were gonna be separated, I wanted more structure, and I wanted to have my own account, separated, legally separated, where my money would go to. And um, I I wanted her to have her own account where her 
money went to or a check went to. Um, but then we reconciled, probably three, broke up and reconciled three or four times in between opening that account and her death. So uh, during one of our separations, I, I opened up a checking account. Okay. It's probably w the easiest answer. Would so. you move money? Did, 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 were the direct deposits from your work still going into your personal account? Right now? Or the, were they then, at the... Then. In October? Yes. Um, I believe so, yes. Okay. And would you move the money into the joint account that you had with Tara and Tara's mom? I would, but I, I don't remember. Um, I can't be... I know, I know um, when we reconciled, she was mad because I had my account still. Mad, mad. And so what I would do is I would get all the money from my um, checking account and just move it all over to our joint account. That way she had, she could pay bills and stuff like that. Um, and it was really easy to do because it was at the same bank and I could just tell the teller, can you just move this amount to that amount? Right, okay. But I never remember it being like an issue. Okay. You've already told us that you and Tara never had uh, fights over money. Did you have, you, just now you said she was mad that you had your own account. Was that about dollars or about separation? It was about separation. Like I think like I never done nothing that drastic. Like I would leave, for, but I, I think she, I think she kind of saw that. He's not speculating. I think she. You can reword it, Tara. You can reword it, uh, Levi. Do you know what Tara was uh, feeling? Did she express? Did she say things that? Okay, I'll hold on. Thank you. Don't tell us what Tara said, but did she say things to you that conveyed how she was feeling about um, the fact that you had a separate checking account? I think she was afraid it was a big step. Okay, and, and was, is that what she was feeling? Yes. Okay. Did you and Tara ever have arguments over since, because you said you had discussed divorce and there was separation. Did, did you and Tara ever have um, arguments or fights over uh, a child custody or child visitation? No, never. Um, never. I don't think she would ever um, take the kids from me. or Because we both know it would have devastated the kids. Like, our kids love us to death. And I, I don't think she would ever try to take the kids away from me. And she knows I would never do that to them. Okay. There was um, a lot of uh, testimony about computers, and I guess you had a, was it Toshiba laptop at your house on yes. Ash Place? Okay. And then you had a Albuquerque Police Department computer that generally stayed in the car but was removable? Yes. Okay. So, uh, one of the things that the computer expert talked about was uh, clearing of temporary internet files. Uh, did you do that? No, I don't know how to do that. So, what, what, what can you describe what sort of uh, computer uh, skills you have? Can you d verbalize that or not? Um, I, did, I never received any formal training in computers. Um, only experience I had was really, this was in 2006, seven. Well, hold on a second. Le I'm still on the thing about the uh, temporary internet files. I have no idea how to do that. I do you know what temporary internet files even are? I have no idea what that is, no. Okay. Did you ever clear the history or clear anything uh, out of the... Uh, Toshiba computer? No. Okay. okay. So there was some discussion that uh, he, somebody looked up several sites. And uh, so I'm going to ask, since you're on the witness stand, I'm going to ask you about those. Um, 
there was discussion about the fact that uh, somebody had searched the name Aaron Jones. Did you do that? I did. Why did you do that? Well, the first time we spoke to Aaron Jones. Um, in you his mean the first time at his office? At his office, so I guess the second time. Um, I don't know if you guys got the transcript, but I said something about, I'm sorry, they're laughing, it's getting me frustrated. Um, Your Honor, could you?
Thank you. Uh, Levi, going back to 2007, what month was the truck stolen again? Um, like October, early October. Okay. Um, and, and, and thank you for letting me know you were distracted, and please let me know again as, if you get distracted. Okay. So now, we were talking about Aaron Jones, and you were talking about going to his office. And you were answering my question about why you looked up Aaron Jones on the computer. Go ahead. Um, okay, so the second time I spoke to him in, in his office, um, he made the comment. Well, I was frustrated. I expressed my frustration. Um, as long as this investigation took place, I couldn't go back to work. I was on administrative leave. And... Uh, it, feel, it feels terrible when you're on leave. You're not even welcome back to work until you have this cloud hanging over you, you know. And I told him, I was like, what are you doing? I mean, how long is this going to take? How long could it take to, to show me somewhere else or to, to prove that this was a suicide? How long could it possibly take? And he made the comment, well, you guys had me on um, admin leave for six months. And you guys being like APD. But I, I had no idea what he was talking about. And it really felt like I, w I felt that he was going to make me pay, like pay for whatever he went through. That's how it was expressed. In that same conversation, did he uh, mention anything about himself being on TV? Yeah, he said that he was, uh, for whatever incident happened, uh, I later learned what it was, but uh, that he was on the news and that he knew. It really felt like he was paying me back for whatever he went through. Okay. And uh, so you were having a conversation, expressing your frustration, and he said, well, hey, I was on administrative leave for six months, and I was the top story on the news one night, and yeah. is that why you looked his name up? <coughs> that contributed to, that was a major contributor, and I, I remember Dave, David Baca, um, who helped me with the funeral stuff, he had expressed to me, I'm not going to say yeah, exactly what he said. Don't, don't say what he said. Basically, wa a warning to me to watch out, because he's not. That's fine. That's okay. fine. Let's go okay. on to something else. An anyways, I wanted to see who I was dealing with. Like, what ex was he really charged for something? Uh, was he really on administrative leave for six months? So I typed in his name. Um, um, I typed in his name, Detective Aaron Jones, and things popped up. And I also went to the Metro Court website to see, because I know how to, I know that website, I had to use it sometimes to check for court, if I had court to, um, and sure enough, his name was on it um, for, I don't want to say that. That's okay. Don't say. Okay, but he was on it, and I learned that he probably was on admin leave for six months, and um, it just kind of gave me an idea of who I was dealing with. Okay. And were you trying to sort of compare and contrast to figure out how long you would be on admin leave? Yeah, I thought, man, he really might try to make me be on six months like he did. You know, I, I thought it was, it was expressed to me like it was vengeful. In the end, did you end up doing more than six months on administrative leave? I was on administrative leave for, when was I charged with, in 2011? Four years. Okay. Now, there was also some discussion about um, military sites, pornographic sites, I think police type sites. Did you make those searches? I did. Okay. And um, there was some discussion about a little scrolling thing that goes uh, across the screen that says, uh, I was married by a judge, I should have asked for a jury or something to that effect. Did you uh, look that up? Did I create that? Yeah, did you do that? No, I didn't do that. Well, do you know how to create that? No, I don't. I don't I'm sure I could figure it out, but I, I didn't know at the time. Okay. Um, the prosecutor, when, when it was pointed out that that 
um, thing about married by a judge should have asked for a jury when that went on to your computer you were on duty at APD and so Mr. McKay suggested that perhaps you were right writing down the road on duty while you were entering a screensaver onto your laptop did you carry your laptop uh, to work with you no it would have been impossible to use a private I don't even know where you get an internet connection well, I guess you would need it for that, but no, that's ridiculous. And did you already ridiculous. have a laptop in your car? I already had a laptop. Okay. There was um, some discussion about a cartoon or something of somebody uh, with a ball and chain and a caption that said something like marriage, ball, and chain. Um, did you look that up? No, I didn't look that up. Did you put that on your computer? No. It was later, there was some testimony that that image later became a screensaver on the home computer. Did you put that on a screensaver? No, I don't even, I don't even think it's funny. I don't even really get it. I mean, it's just, it's not something that I would even, I don't know. Did I didn't do that. Did you ever see it as a screensaver on that computer? I think I saw it. I, I mean, I see it here and I think, well, maybe I saw it. I mean, I think I did, but I don't. It didn't make that much of an impression on me to carry it seven okay. years later. All right. There was some discussion um, about um, a wet t shirt contest, anchor woman, something or other. Did you look that up? I did. Okay. Why? I saw a news thing, um, like a, it was on the news or something that some anchor woman lost her job for being like in a white t-shirt contest or something like that. Okay. I remember, I remember seeing it on TV and I, I'm sure I looked it up. Okay. And the different spellings, was that because you didn't know how to spell the woman's name? I suppose so. I don't remember every, every keystroke I made, but okay. I'm sure. Okay. Uh, there was some discussion about someone visiting a site of how to rip a throat out at some point or other. I don't know if they had a day and time on that. And somebody looking up how to kill somebody. Did you look that up? I remember. Um, I do remember that. Okay. Uh, tell the jury about that. Um, it's kind of immature. Uh, my whole life I've been into uh, martial arts. Like my entire life, um, even when I joined the military, I continued training and to this day. Um, back then, I remember I was trying to find, there was a martial arts system that somebody told me about that claimed to be able to rip throats out and stuff like that. And I don't believe, at the, I don't believe it now, and at the time I didn't believe it, like that there was a martial arts system so deadly or whatever. And I remember looking up um, how to rip somebody's throat out because I wanted to find that martial art. Did you know the name of it? I do now. But at the time, did you know it? No, I had no idea. Is that what you were trying to find out? I was trying to do, I, I put a bunch of search. I put that in because I was trying to put in what people told me and how to kill somebody because I was thinking like unarmed combat, like not with, the, not with a weapon, but with like your bare hands. But it would be mortal hand-to-hand -hand combat? Yeah, I was trying to, I was young. I'm, I mean, um, but I was trying to find the name of this martial art that somebody told me about and... Uh, so when you typed in how to kill somebody, um, what came up, the jury and all of us saw was a one little, one little pager, kind of dumb little article. Yeah, it was not what I was looking for. Um, how, how long was on it? Uh, 26 seconds, 28 seconds? I'm sorry. I'm sorry for answering your question, Levi. Um, yeah, it was a few seconds. Uh, I think I probably read it and it was not what I was looking for, obviously, and I moved on. But I think the first, I was looking at the rip throat out thing first. I know how it sounds like it, immature, and I probably was, but I was trying to find this martial arts system. I know what it is now, but I didn't know it then. Okay. Um, 
Levi, I, uh, I'm just about done for now. I'm sure council will have some questions for you and I'll probably have some more questions for you, okay? So I would like you to just, um, just answer the questions honestly and it's a question. You know, we've had yesterday there was preambles that lasted five minutes. Thank you. Okay. So I just want you to answer the questions honestly. Right before I sit down, I want you to look at the jury and and tell them, did you kill your wife, the mother of your children, Tara Chavez? Absolutely not. Did you tap excuse me. Did you tamper with any evidence to make her death look like a suicide when it was really a murder? No, I did not. Thank you, Levi. I'll be talking to you in a bit. We'll let people continue with the business. All right.